Thank you. It's nice to see what a crowd this is. I did just recently publish this book. I think you should all at least look at it and otherwise enjoy it because it's going to answer all your questions. What happened to the world's megafauna? Is the extinction a thing and should I be worried about it? And did I, Ross McPhee, ever eat a mammoth steak on the Siberian tundra? The answers to which are yes, yes, no. So in a nutshell, End of the Megafauna, the book, is about a lost world. But one not that different from ours today, but sadly diminished. And diminished in the sense that all of the largest, fiercest, hugest, as the subtitle goes, animals, with few exceptions, have disappeared. So how it came to be so is what I want to talk about tonight. We're going to be talking about theories and we're going to be talking about evidence because that's what this institution is all about. So what's been lost? Well, one of the things you're looking at right now is a gorilla-sized lemur from the island of Madagascar. This too was a Madagascan vertebrate. This is an elephant bird that weighed in about five to 800 pounds. So three to five ostrich worth in its size. This splendid animal, woolly rhino, which disappeared about 11,000 years ago. And finally, this relative of the Komodo dragon, which is the world's largest living lizard. This guy was 30 feet long, lived in Australia up into about 40,000 years ago. And you're not the only one that's terrified, so is this wallaby who's about to be a meal. So we still, of course, have lots of megafauna left. We have elephants, ostriches, crocodiles, all of these animals that are 100 pounds or better, which is the body size that we use to define megafauna. But what you're looking at now is an illustration of mammals of two kinds. The ones in gray are the super megafauna, the really big guys that come in at 2,000 pounds or better. And you see that they're restricted to elephants and rhinos that live in South Asia and Africa. Everything else you see, which includes some smaller animals as well, have completely disappeared. You notice, for example, that there aren't any super megavores that are left in the New World, whereas there were just a few thousand years ago. Now, what does this mean? Well, it obviously means that there's been a lot of losses. What I want to bring forward to you is that this is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just the New World, it's not just Europe, it's every island, practically habitable island, on the face of the planet that has lost a very substantial part of its fauna in the last 50,000 years. 50,000 years is what we now call near time, as opposed to deep time, that real paleontologists deal with. This is South America, shortly before the extinctions that occurred there, with giant ground sloths, giant armadillos, other weird beasts. The only Living lineage is represented by this canid, this dog-like animal that you see here, which still survives on the continent. And then Madagascar. Madagascar has lost practically everything of size that used to live there as recently as a thousand years ago. So all of the big lemurs, pygmy hippos, native crocodiles, elephant birds, giant tortoises, they're all gone. Everybody here with the exception of this snake bird, and Hinga, which still lives in Africa, and Europe, and other, elsewhere, is the only survivor that you're seeing in this particular painting. Here's the body count. This is based on a number of assumptions because we don't necessarily have good evidence for the totality of these losses. But within a ballpark kind of frame, it's probably fairly accurate. So somewhere around 300 to 350 mammal species. Many more birds, because bird extinctions on islands, particularly in the South Pacific, have been prodigious indeed. Reptiles, we're not really sure. I'm saying 100, it could be much more, it could be much less. And amphibians, we have no idea whatsoever how many have been lost in near time. So this raises the question, what the heck happened? There are many ideas, and ideas is what we work with. This is our currency in science 
developing ideas, testing them, and seeing what comes out in the wash as being the ideas that are best supported by the evidence. So in the case of near-time extinctions, there's a lot of ideas, but I'm going to group them into three units. First of all, there's ones that are concerned with climate, climate change, because in the period that we're talking about, 50,000 years ago, there was an enormous amount of change on the planet because that was the last ice age that we've now come out into and are now in a warming period, a very warming period. Then there's a number of arguments that would suggest that people were, if not universally responsible, at least responsible for a large number of these losses. And we're going to take a close look at those as well. And then there's other ideas. Some of these are half-baked, wacko. But the point is, they've been proposed because the other main theories, which would be climate change and people, have deficits. They have problems with the argument. And that's what I want to bring out tonight. So that when you walk away from this, it's not, oh, God, McPhee, he just can't make up his mind. Instead, it's that this is the way the process of science actually works. You accept nothing. You look at the evidence and you, after much grueling effort, decide what you're going to support. And you also look at ideas that are on the fringes because from time to time, those are the ones that are correct. Just ask Albert Einstein. Okay, so we're gonna use some of Patricia Wynn's cartoons to illustrate these major ideas. This is one that would implicate people, which my colleagues lovingly call overkill. So using this form of, uh, of identification, we're gonna to go to climate change. And we're gonna call that overchill. And then the final one we're going to look at is about an impactor that might have hit the planet 12,900 years ago. And what do you think we're going to call it? Overgrill, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And because we don't have a clear idea at all what was really responsible, we're looking back. We don't have a time machine. All we've got are the kinds of evidence that we can collect in the form of bones, now with biomolecules to a certain extent, dating through radiocarbon. This is what we have to conjure with and put together stories that are worth testing. So let's begin with Overchill. Let's talk about the facts. Now, in grade school, we probably all learned about ecological zonation. Ecological zonation being, in the simplest form, that we've got a tropical part of the world around the equator, we go into the semi-tropics, temperate regions, and then high latitude polar. And this is what we think of as normal, because this is what we're used to. But you only have to go back 20,000 years to see a, different, a very different world indeed. The biggest difference has to do with the ice. 25,000 years ago, where we're standing right now, was under ice. Ice that originated in the northern part of Canada and spread out from there, as the illustration suggests, all across Canada into the northern tier of the US. Smaller, but nevertheless still very large ice caps existed in Eurasia as well. Among many other things, just the size of these objects made a difference. There was so much fresh water that was locked up in them that sea level dropped about 120 meters, so well over 300 feet. There was so much water locked up, and it was so cold that evaporation over the world ocean was lessened, which means there was less water everywhere. That had a prodigious effect on plant life. So for example, if you combine the white and the blue areas, the blue area being steppe of one form or another, you can see that the whole northern part of the planet was in very, very cold or semi-cold conditions with reduced plant life and so forth. And everything else, all of this zonation was packed much more towards the equator. Unlike today, where you've got temperate regions going well up into the northern part of our continent. So one of the things that happened was that the rainforest, having less precipitation, generally cooler conditions, 
reduced down to refugial areas. If you have in your mind's eye an idea of how big the rainforest is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, you can see here that it's a fraction of that. Similarly with Amazonia, Amazonia was cut up into bits with grassland intervening, which is a very hard thing to imagine today as the result of climate at the time. What it also meant was that grasslands could expand dramatically since they're dry adapted and the mid-latitude deserts. So this world looks a lot like the world today, but in detail, it wasn't. And this was the world of the megafauna. Here, for example, in this painting, what we're seeing is a scene in Rancho La Brea. Everything here is dead. It's all disappeared, including sloths, camels. Does everyone know that camels originated in North America? You don't have to like camels. I'm not asking that you like camels. But they're yours. They're your own. You should respect that. So the climate change people don't have a great answer to how climate change by itself could have produced these effects. And the particular effect that I'm talking about in respect of North America was a collapse of this fauna, some of which is illustrated here, in a very short period, maybe no longer than 400 years, between, roughly speaking, 11 and 12,000 years ago. The big ice age, which you'd think would have been responsible for these extinctions, was over and done with by about 18,000. From 18,000 forward, we were into a warming period, and things were not exactly like today, but they were getting warmer. So how can it be that the most dramatic effect of the recent period produced no extinctions? We're very few. Another aspect of this is that there was more than one ice age. In fact, there were 22 that we know of, advances and retreats of the ice in the last 2.6 million years, which is the Pleistocene and the Holocene. During this period, most of the species that I'm going to be talking about were already in existence. They'd already evolved. Yet they weathered those particular ups and downs of climate. They may well have suffered in respect of range size. They may well have suffered in respect of the kinds of food they could eat, but they made it through until 11 to 12,000 years ago. So who knows what happened? Well, let me tell you. This man, Paul Martin, thought he knew. Paul Martin, who was a good friend of mine, was a professor of geosciences at the University of Arizona for many years. And he was really the one who developed and elaborated the theory that I'm now going to talk about, overkill. And this is how he approached the question. He developed a series of three features that seemed to be true of this entire period of, of near time. And in each case, there's verification from various bodies of evidence suggesting that Paul was correct in isolating them as critical features. The first one there's no real disagreement about. Where the extinctions occurred, there were a lot of losses. And, and by no disagreement, I mean people supporting climate change or other theories also agree with this. And that large mammals were affected disproportionately. This is very important. They were not globally synchronous. But you'd think if there was one serious effect that was global in extent, it would have affected all of these species that disappeared at more or less the same time. Yes, there could have been survival in some places, greater losses in other places, but you'd expect to see a general envelope of synchronicity. And that's what we don't see. And we know that from carbon-14 dating, which was Paul's biggest contribution by pointing out that you could date to a very large degree when these extinctions occurred. Another thing that's very important is that when people spread across the planet from Africa, which occurred over a couple of hundred thousand years, it seems that whenever they got to a new place where they hadn't been previously resident, the next thing that happened was a faunal collapse of serious magnitude on most of the continents and absolutely devastating on islands. So what you have to picture is that as people spread across the planet, every time they showed up in a new place, something bad happened. We call this first biological contact, the idea that when people came, came to a new place and encountered the biota that lived there at the time, it was new on both sides. 
So let's look at what we're calling the, the diaspora here. This is a very simplified version, of course, of what happened as Homo sapiens spread across the planet. Point number one, we originated in Africa. Homo sapiens is African by origin. That's our lineage. The dating now is that we were already present at least 350,000 years ago in Northern Africa. And at some time shortly subsequent to that, we got into Eurasia. And thereafter, it's a question of spreading wherever we could possibly go. By 65,000 years ago, so the current evidence is, we were probably in Australia. We were in northernmost Siberia by 45,000 years ago. These are minimum estimates. And we got to the New World somewhere after the close of the last glacial maximum. This is a very controversial area, but let's just say 16 to 18,000 years ago, people were in the New World for the first time. And then finally, people spread throughout and into the last habitable places on Earth, which would be the temperate and equatorial islands, wherever they lay, with the South Pacific being the last of them. There were people for the first time probably in New Zealand about 800 years ago. Now, let's couple the diaspora with the extinctions. The first major losses, and by major, I mean lots of species with an apparently short period of time, so in that sense, at least temporally connected. This was in Australia about 40,000 years ago, as best as we can estimate at the moment. Remember, people seem to have got there about 65,000 years ago. So there is a gap, but nevertheless, the losses occurred subsequent to the first human appearance, at least for the Pleistocene. Animals were lost around 11 to 12,000 years ago in all the places where the yellow explosions are. So across the northern tier of Asia, down into all of North America and all of South America for that matter. Then it's the islands in the Mediterranean around 10,000 years ago, the islands forming the West Indies perhaps 6,000 years ago, Madagascar about 1,000 years ago, and then all of these last places on earth where people could make a living, the South Pacific, with the very last of them occurring perhaps only a couple of hundred years before Captain Cook ended up in New Zealand. Now, it is this coupling of the first appearance of humans and the subsequent faunal collapse that gives particular strength to the overkill argument. It seems we got there, we did something hideous, which is not like us at all, right? <laughs> and the animals died in droves. So there's puzzles connected with this, and here's mystery number one. You saw the pattern of loss. Northern Eurasia, continents of the New World, all of these islands, so on and so forth, but there were some places where losses, coupled losses, lots of them in a short time period, didn't occur. And those are Africa and South Asia. Now, what do you do with this? This is a major puzzle because, as I said, humans originated in Africa. So we go back, and the mammals that we dealt with through this long history were all there at the time. So how could it be that there weren't all of these losses in those places, yet there were everywhere else? Well, Paul turned this into a positive for his argument by pointing out that since people arose there and lived there for a very long period of time, they were known to the prey species. So there was sort of an arms race that, go on, that went on. As we got better at making tools, they got better at avoiding predators. So over time, the balance was that yes, hunting was possible, but this destruction on unbelievable scales like you saw in North and South America did not happen. And he made the same argument for the South. End result, no faunal Armageddon in Africa and South Asia, but destruction everywhere else. Okay, so we'll accept that. Another problem. <clears throat> in North America, there were about 70 species that disappeared 
between 11 and 12,000 years ago, according to the paleontology. Not all of those were large, more than 100 pounds, but probably around three quarters were. So you're talking about a large number of large animals. You'd think that if there was a mass slaughter, that we'd have good evidence of it, that there would be all kinds of kill sites, just windrows of bones and evidence of butchery and all of this kind of thing, if people were killing on this kind of scale. In fact, we don't see that. What we see instead is the very occasional evidence of hunting. And I'm talking just hunting, not overhunting. So the question comes, where are the bodies? If people were responsible at this level, shouldn't we expect to see more? Paul's argument, not a very strong re rejoinder, I must say, was that we can't really expect that because this is far back in the past, 10,000 years or more. And the absence of evidence, you've all heard this, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Well, you know, try that out with your significant other when you come home late one night. See where that gets you. It doesn't cut the mustard. And it's a, an explanation that we don't know what to do with, or it's a set of facts that we don't know what to do with. You'd expect that under any of these circumstances that there should be lots of bodies, but there isn't. So that's a conundrum. Now, let's think about this. So you're recently arrived in North America. You've got across the Bering Land Bridge. You're seeing all of these big mammals that nobody's ever hunted. They look at you and they see this awkward looking featherless biped, doesn't seem to know what he's all about. There's, there's no big canines, there's no horns or other ornamentation, just running around with pointy sticks. What's that all about? So the idea here, which is borrowed from ecology, is that you can have the phenomenon called behavioral naivete. That unless you've been, for example, predated upon very heavily, you as an animal are not going to recognize a predator, particularly a novel, weird-looking predator like a hominin. So you're just going to ignore it. But meanwhile, those humans, they're seeing all the meat on the hoof and thinking, all right, party time. Paul's argument was that when these uh, first inhabitants came over, if they weren't already big game hunters, they quickly became such. Because what did they want? They want what humans want in all circumstances, which is to control all resources and to make as many copies of themselves as possible. So the idea was that there was a massive population expansion right at this period when humans were first moving into the Americas. Because now you had food security, you had all of these guys that you could easily hunt. And then eventually, of course, the extinctions went to completion because there was so much overhunting and the end result was these losses. Let's go to overgrill. So overgrill, I don't think I have to tell you a lot about this particular scenario. 66 million years ago, an impactor from outer space hit, as we now know, somewhere off the Yucatan Peninsula, and whammo, end of story. Whatever happened, nuclear winter, global wildfire, you name it, it took out around 75%, so we estimate, of species then living. They weren't all dinosaurs, went all the way down to planktonic forams living in the ocean surface. So the parallel argument for us is that there was an impactor, the people who developed this argument, coyly suggested that it came down at about 12,900 years ago, and wherever it hit, We'll get to that point in a minute. Wherever it hit, it did the same sort of thing, but probably on a reduced scale, as compared to the Chicxulub impactor 66 million years ago. So how do we know this? There's evidence. It's like shocked quartz grains, which are all about the strength of the impact. Something peculiar to these Pleistocene examples of this particular impactor is something called black mats, which are found in the southwestern part of this country, which the supporters of 
overgrills suggest are exemplary of a very widespread fire initiated by the impactor. Now, I think it is distinctly possible that there was an impactor at this time. The fundamental question for us, however, is did it do the job? Did it do any of the jobs in respect of the losses that we're talking about? You won't be surprised when I say that we don't know very much about exactly what happened. But to give you one note of optimism, thanks to lots of thinking and effort, we do have a good idea why large mammals were hit in particular. And this is really easy to relate with because we're large mammals, at least I am. And here's how it works. Large mammals have very similar life histories, as we call them, for certain features. One is that gestational periods are long. So we're nine months, but you go to the living elephants and it's anywhere from 22 to 24 months. Typically, there's also, relative to smaller species, a longer maturation. So again, to, to point to elephants, it's something like 10 or 11 years before they're sexually mature in the case of African elephants, 12 to 14 in the case of Asian elephants. Yes, we live long lives. That's another part of being big. That's one of our, I guess, positives in life history. But these other features are ones that mean that if our populations get hit very hard in certain parts of the life cycle, certain parts of the demography, then it takes a long time to come back. So for all of these arguments, what we really should have in mind as to why it was bad to be big is not the details of what specific trigger mechanism took them out, but because they suffer or they have as their native aspect that there are these risks you take as a result of being big that smaller animals don't. One other thing to mention is that most births for large animals are singletons. Twins rarely, anything larger than that is unusual. So you can imagine if you get hit very hard, what it's going to take to recover from that. Whether it was climate change, overkill, an impactor, it doesn't matter. I want to leave you with another kind of idea, which is since we don't know the whole story, and since there are these arguments against any of the theories that I've developed here, maybe the most serviceable idea is that it was some combination of the likeliest events, which is what this particular figure is trying to show. And I kind of like this because at this point in our understanding of these megafaunal extinctions, there's no point in being a very strong advocate of any one of these solutions. They all might have played a role and the point is, and the reason why this is still a great natural history puzzle, well worth spending our time on, is because it has certain implications. And this is the implication that I want to leave you with. Why should we be particularly worried about the surviving megafauna on the planet? It's because they have these same life history characters that I was just talking about. Here you're looking at the last male northern white rhino that died out earlier this year. Fortunately, in this case, I suppose fortunately is the right word, semen was collected from him, and in future, there's going to be an effort to see whether you'll get viable hybrids, as you probably will, with southern white rhinos. But you can see the handwriting on the wall. As we continue to despoil the planet, taking resources wherever we want to take them, doing what we please, then inevitably animals like this are the ones that are going to suffer most. So the end of the megafauna that I'm talking about is not necessarily the end of the end. And I want you to bear that in mind. Thank you.